breathes easily. His muscles, his chest cavity and the pressure of the atmosphere team dry easily and as easily letting it out again. Artificial respiration of an asphyxiated casualty by the Holger Nielsen method is a mechanical imitation of the concertina action of the chest. But it cannot expand the chest so fully as can the muscles of a conscious man and the artificial breath into the casualty's lungs is shallow. Even when the casualty is placed so as to allow the most open possible airway into the lungs, tests have shown that still more air should really be shifted in and out for good resuscitation. The chest cavity must be fully expanded if the lungs are to be fully ventilated, and so the best value we got out of breathing. The reason for this can be better understood by studying the lungs. In this simplified picture, the lung on the right shows the air tubes and the lung on the left the blood vessels. In reality, air tubes and blood vessels are intertwined in a spongy mass. Looking at the air tubes first, the main airway divides into bronchi. The bronchi divide again into bronchioles and right at the end are air sacs called alveoli. Air breathed in can go right down to these alveoli and then go out again the way it came in. In the other lung, the air tubes are not shown beyond the bronchi, but they must be imagined to be intertwined with the blood vessels. The blue vessels contain the blood coming from the heart, which, like the air, moves into smaller and smaller channels until innumerable tiny blood vessels are separated from the alveoli by only the thinnest of walls. Through these thin walls, oxygen from the air passes into the blood and so the blood is purified. The blood flows out of the lungs by channels which join and join again until they are once more large blood vessels taking the blood back to the heart ready to be recirculated round the body. During breathing, of course, the lungs expand and contract, but in this picture we shall suggest breathing much more simply. When breathing is deep, air penetrates right into the recesses of the honeycomb of alveoli, where the walls of the tiny blood vessels are thinnest, and where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place most easily. The blood is thoroughly purified before it finds its way back to the heart for recirculation round the body. When breathing is shallow, the honeycomb of alveoli is not properly ventilated. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is less, and the blood may not be thoroughly purified. One good deep breath is worth a dozen shallow breaths. This is true for the normal active person, and much more true for an asphyxiated casualty whose blood has begun to be starved of oxygen from the moment he has ceased to breathe. The quickest and easiest way of getting plenty of air to move in and out of a casualty's lungs is to lift up his chin, tilt back his head, close his nose, open your mouth wide, seal it round his mouth and breathe into him. The importance of lifting up the chin and tilting back the head can be seen in this model. Loss of consciousness relaxes the muscles. The tongue drops and blocks the airway. The airway can be opened by tilting the head right back and at the same time lifting the chin right up. So, once again, close the nose, seal your mouth round the mouth of the casualty and breathe into him. You can feel the air going in and you can see his chest rise. If the chest does not rise, first clear his mouth of any obstruction. Then check the position for a good airway and try again. By taking good deep breaths, the first aider can easily supply enough air for two, for himself and for the casualty who so badly needs it. Breathe fairly quickly at first and then slow down to your normal rate of breathing. Asphyxiated casualties, except in carbon monoxide poisoning, have a pale bluish look. After perhaps 10 or 12 breaths, the colour of the casualty should change from this bluish look to a pinker, healthier colour. Something like the face on the right. The face on the left is being kept blue to show the amount of change to expect. 
But even if the colour has changed, go on breathing air in. It may be some time yet before the casualty's lungs work again properly on their own. And just as in other methods, it is the steady continuing of resuscitation which matters. The only object is to get air in and out of the lungs. And if you think it easier, you can try closing the mouth and blowing air in through the casualty's nose. But speed is what matters. Know what you have to do and do it at once. The one mistake which can really harm the casualty is not starting breathing into him directly you find him. If the colour does not improve after 10 or 12 breaths, it is likely that the blood is not being purified because the heart is not beating and blood circulation has stopped. The way to find out, as these two first aiders will show, is to feel for the pulse at the carotid pressure point. If there is no pulse, the heart has stopped, and an attempt can be made to get the blood circulating again by rhythmic external pressure on the heart, with the hands over the lower half of the sternum bone, like this. The correct pressure for an adult casualty is 50 pounds, obviously much less for a child. This rhythmic pressure forces the valves in the heart to pump blood, and there is a chance that it will stimulate the heart to take over again. The first aider can practice finding the correct position on another first aider, but should only try pressing on a model, giving six to eight sharp presses at the rate of one a second. And then breathing in again through the mouth. If two first aiders are available, one can do the pressure on the heart and the other can breathe in air. This one is using an alternative method of closing the nose with his cheek. Six to eight sharp presses on the lower half of the sternum bone. A breath in. The model being practiced on here is Rasasi An. Another model is the Ambu. Either can be used for practicing the alternation of breathing air in and applying pressure on the heart to circulate the blood artificially. But once again, do not use pressure except on a model. So with an asphyxiated casualty, head back and chin up, close nose and breathe in the air through the mouth. You should feel it go in and see the chest rise. If you don't, check the position for a good airway and try again. If the air is still not going in, clear the airway by turning the casualty half round and slapping smartly on the back. And by removing any obstruction from the mouth. Then try again using either mouth to mouth or mouth to nose. After a dozen or so breaths, the colour should become healthier. Carry on till natural breathing begins again. If the colour does not change, a check at the carotid pressure point may show that there is no pulse and external pressure on the heart should be alternated with breathing. Above all, act quickly. Resuscitation can only succeed if it is started at once, without wasting time on preliminaries, and is carried on steadily and accurately. <laughs>